there, my name is Janelle, and we're going to make my new pattern, the Mountain Saddlebags. It comes in two sizes, the tall and the mini, and both of them feature a really nice wide base that tapers down at the top with some strapping detail on the sides. I'm calling this the strap anchor, and these are side bands, and they match this center strip right here, and it fastens up with a cute little baby lock, press lock, that we sell in our shop. Um, it's got, got a nice firmness to it, and I'll show you how we achieve that soon. And we're going to install the locks, and I'm even going to show you how to add some rivets like I've done on this um, Harris Tweed version here. So those add a really nice detail as well. Now I'll just go through some of the uh, fabric choices and interfacing choices for you so you can know what to pick for yourself. Okay, so we'll grab the pattern. And in the front, you'll notice on the materials list, I've suggested quilt and cotton for both the exterior fabric and the exterior accent. And the accent, let me just grab one of these bags again, is this st strapping detail here on the sides and the shoulder strap. We use interfacing that's fusible, which is a woven interfacing. And the reason why we use woven interfacing is because it attaches to the fabric and acts like the fabric, which means it doesn't create papery creases and wrinkles. And I've also got some Decoville Light, which is a firmer stabilizer. It's a little bit stiffer. Um, it's not widely found. We sell it on mlinebags.com, but if you're finding that the cost is a bit prohibitive or you can't find it in your neighborhood or your area, although we do ship, um, just go with another layer of woven interfacing. You can even use two in the areas where I ask you to attach the Decoville light. And maybe someday when you're feeling a little bit more adventurous, you'll try to get the Decoville light and try that out because it makes a really nice firm finish on this bag. Another way that that is achieved is with the last requirement here, the sew-in foam stabilizer. So the foam is either a Bianni's or Bozal or some people have Pellon Flex Foam and it makes this bag that stays together, it doesn't flatten and it's really quite durable. You can squish it and it pops back up again. Now we also have a zipper, a nine inch zipper and I've just uh, cut off some zipper by the yard here, a nine or 10 inch length. Our pocket is eight inches wide so we'll need to make sure it's at least nine inches. And we have a press lock. I recommend a baby press lock. We sell these at Emmeline Bags, but if you have a larger press lock, these are thumb, sometimes called thumb catches or tongue locks. You can use a larger one too. Don't be scared off by these. I'm gonna show you how to put them in and they're really easy. And that's what's kind of nice about this bag is you get a bag that looks a little bit more complex, but it's still easy to do for a beginner. And we've got some rectangular rings in three quarter inch and a strap slider and that's used to make the adjustable shoulder strap. Okay, so just go through the front page. Um, print as I've suggested in the instructions here, which is to print from Adobe Reader. The seam allowance throughout the pattern is three eighth uh, of an inch or one centimeter. And we do use a quarter of an inch for attaching our zipper and one eighth of an inch for top stitching. I'll let you know when that happens too. So the first thing we're gonna do is cut out our paper pattern pieces. I like to print my main pattern pieces for the front and back and the flap, the ones that say place on fold. It's nice to print them twice. And then you can leave one of the pieces just a little bit wider than the other and then flip one over and tape it together. And so just leave that gap there when you're cutting it out and then tape it together. And what this does is, yes, you can place it on the fold, but when you do place it on the fold of fabric, you actually increase the, the fabric size just a little bit because of that um, fold right there. So if you're using a thicker fabric, you can increase the width of your fabric up to even an eighth of an inch. So for beginners, it's kind of nice to just have one piece. You can trace around it with a pen. You can pin it down and cut it with a scissors. You can use a rotary cutter to cut them out 
but um, for accuracy, it's nice to have one piece instead of using on the fold. Now, um, another thing that you can do, if you do venture into Harris Tweed, instead of cutting the interfacing in the interfacing column, you can block fuse some interfacing onto your tweed. So tweed or any other heavily woven fabric frays quite easily. So if you go ahead and fuse your woven interfacing directly onto this using steam before you start, so get all that fused down, then when you cut out your pattern pieces, you won't get those frayed edges. So if you're doing that, and if you're using tweed, you can skip um, the individual pieces that you're cutting out for the pattern pieces and you can um, actually you can skip the decoville as well because I've made a tweed bag this one where did it go and I didn't use the decoville on it and I feel like it has great stability and sturdiness I mean maybe I could have put it on this front part um, but once there's items in this bag it'll be nice and firm if you're using cork, vinyl, or leather, which again, I would prefer you not to do if you're a beginner, you don't need to cut out the interfacing for the straps. You can do it without. If you're cutting um, from a wide bolt, 60 inches, I've got some instructions here for your strap, shoulder strap, but, and if you're using a regular material off the bolt, which is 44 inches, you go with this option, okay. I want to tell you what to do for directional print because in here I do say that directional prints are not recommended but if you choose to make the outer bag out of a directional print meaning if you have a fabric here well let me just go grab one that is a directional print okay so I've got these cats and they're all facing up with their heads to the top of the fabric they're not upside down and twisted. So really you want to keep this side of the fabric at the top and this at the bottom. That would be considered a directional print. So how then would you cut your gusset? Because your gusset goes all the way around the bag to the other side. So if you were to just cut it like so, you would have sideway ca sideways cats. And if you cut it like so, when it wrapped around, the cats on the side would be upside down. So I'll show you what to do for that. So what you can do for that is fold your pattern piece in half as accurately as possible. And then you need to add a seam allowance on one side of this. So our seam allowance in our pattern is 3 8 of an inch. If you want to, you can go at a quarter if you want, but I line up on these fold marks. I'll just make it easier for me to see. And extend that 3 eighths of an inch. So I'm gonna cut that piece off, and this is gonna be our new pattern piece. Scissors. So what you can do for this now is cut two pieces this way. So now your cats, are going to be facing up. And you're probably wondering, Janelle, why didn't you do that in the first place? Well, I do have a good reason, and it goes back to having accurate pieces. Once you add this seam allowance in, you're creating an area where you could possibly get a bit of a larger piece of fabric cut out. Because when some people cut fabric, they're not right on the line. It could be be up to an eighth of an inch bigger once you add that in and the seam if it's not that accurate and we're since we're sewing a gusset around we want it to fit perfectly so the side the corners fit in beautifully I thought for a beginner it would be nice to have one piece that way you reduce your chance for error and it's gonna make you're gonna make sure that it fits just perfectly but if you want to go straight ahead and and make that template instead oops like that cut it like that. Then you can cut um, two of these for the outer and two of these for the lining. And if you want to, you can use the interfacing piece just as it is. You don't need to cut that one in half. Now, when you're cutting out your fabric, you just need to make sure that you have enough. So if you start cutting your 
pieces like this, you need two front and backs and one flap, you're not gonna have enough for your gusset over here. So what I recommend you do is you open that this up and cut the piece that you only need one of, which is your front flap on one layer. And you'll be cutting a double layer for the front and back body and the gusset pieces. I'm going to do my front and back, just like Lynn's here, with the um, same fabric as I've used as my strapping. I just thought that that would look pretty cool this time around. So there's tons of things you can do. My testers have experimented with it and had a lot of fun. All right, so let's go back and cut all of our fabric pieces your exterior fabric, your accent, the lining, the interfacing, the decoville light. And then when you're done with that, what you're going to need to do is make sure you mark the top and bottom centers. Now I have you make little snips to do this because if you use a pen line and you're using removable pen, those will come out. And later on when you are putting your bag together and you really need to match up this bottom seam, you won't be able to see it anymore. So just do a tiny little snip on the fold at the bottom and the top of all of your fabric pieces. Only snip in about an eighth of an inch and then we're going to get ready to interface. So the outer pieces, the exterior pieces get the Duckville light and the lining pieces get the interfacing. Unless you've opted to not use Decoville light this time around, then you would have interfacing on both of these. The first thing I like to do is make sure I have the steam on, on my iron, and make sure that's well centered, and then I give the whole thing a spritz. I have this on the highest heat setting, and of course you can test it with your iron to make sure that you don't have any scorching, but the highest heat setting, and you steam it, press the steam, overlap, a little bit of seam, and keep moving it as you go. So the overlapping helps because if you have big holes on the bottom of your iron where the steam comes out, those will create bubbles that aren't fused. So you may want to make sure that you're overlapping a lot. And now one of the things um, for this particular interfacing or stabilizer is that you need to let it sit for a good half an hour to cool down before you start working with it or manipulating it and that will make the the glue stick even better so then just give it a smooth out from the other side and i do that the same way as i do my sf 101 shape flex fusible woven interfacing i get the whole thing wet by spraying it you might not be able to see that there but then overlap it as well and give it extra steam. You can test the corners to see if they're fused, but um, if you're doing that, if you get it damp, and you can get it soaking if you want to, that's not a matter. In fact, the more you get it wet, if it's going to shrink, it'll pull in at this point and do the pre-shrinking for you. Now, one thing I do want to mention is the interfacing that you cut for the strapping, which is the strap anchors and side bands, and the shoulder strap, don't put those on yet. We'll put those on while we're making the straps. Okay, we've got all of our interfacing and our Decoville light on. I just wanna show you a little tip about this interfacing here for the pocket linings and the facing. I like to cut them just slightly smaller so that when um, I do fuse them on, I don't have interfacing poking over the edges and getting onto my ironing board. So just cut the pocket lining and the um, facing interfacings are just a little bit smaller and fuse those on. Um, these are the one, my outer fabrics, my exterior fabrics, and you can see they have the Decoville light on. And I know some of you might be wondering, well, why haven't I put the interfacing or the Decoville light all the way to the edges on these pieces? And the reason why is because it will reduce the bulk in the seams if we don't have interfacing and Decoville light all the way to the edge. 
it will be very hard to sew with all of that in the seams and we want all sewing machines to be able to handle the thickness of these layers and that was actually one of the other reasons why I don't have a seam here on the gusset because by the time you add the seam allowance in here it just adds more thickness and we're just gonna I found that bags turn nicer and they lay flatter when they have no interfacing in the seam allowances so for the soft and stable I have some instructions on how to add that at the top of page four so read through that and basically I just grabbed some scrap um, SF1 or sorry not SF101 um, soft and stable and find pieces that are so slightly larger than the pattern pieces that I'm using okay so I've got my front flap here and my two body pieces my front and back and my gusset this one is great because I have seem to have a lot of long scraps so this uses some of my long scraps and then what we do is we actually pin every I don't know four to five inches we'll do some pins um, to pin it to the soft and stable so it doesn't slide it's a bit tougher going through the Duckville light but I find it's still totally worth it to pin all the way around um, we use our walking foot to base stitch this around and the reason why we use our our walking foot is so the top fabric doesn't slide I have a tester who likes to use spray um, adhesive 505 to stick these on because she finds that the fabric slides but she doesn't use a walking foot and that would be why it's sliding for her I don't like messing with spray I'm too messy of a person and it gets all over my house and my dog and dog hair and everywhere so I just use pins so put that walking foot attachment on use a long stitch length and you're going to sew around the circumference of all of these using a one quarter of an inch seam allowance. So that is six millimeters. And I'll show you what that looks like. So I've sew basted those on, and now we're ready to trim this off. And we trim it right next to the stitching line. And again, it's sort of like grading seams, so it keeps it out of the seam allowances so that we don't have bulky seams. Now, it's okay if you snip a few stitches here and then it's still going to be tacked in place but sew as close to or sorry cut as close to that stitching line as you can and trim all that off the back be really careful that you don't cut your your fabric I've done that in the past so some of the stitches might get trimmed out and that's okay I either trim it from the back like that or sometimes if I get bored it seems like I can, I can only do things for so long one way and then I get bored I trim it from the front like so. We'll just trim all that out. And then when we're done, we will just put the exterior pieces to the side. And we're gonna start working on our lining. What we do is we get our pocket facing and we're going to draw on our zipper box. And for this, you can use any pen, an ink pen or whatever. And fold it in half to find the center. If you haven't already marked centers, you can just do that with a pen. Now this zipper box is a lot larger than I usually use on here. I'm gonna do a eight inch wide zipper and this zipper is actually really quite wide. The zipper is quite wide. It goes quite a, quite a ways towards the outer side and that is because we're gonna be turning our bag through the zipper. And with all these layers, I wanted to make sure that the zipper pocket was actually wide as possible so I find that the seven and a half which is was a bit short so I'm gonna go with the eight inch so I put my center mark underneath the line of the four the four measurement because our zipper box is eight inches long four is halfway and just draw a line from one to eight and then I want another line just three eighths of an inch down from that so that is right here. I use my markings on here at the 3 8 inch mark or one centimeter if you're using metric. And then I will close up the ends nice and straight. 
and then let's just do a pen line in the middle of these two. It's easier than measuring because then you will be drawing right on your center line instead of drawing just over the top edge of it. So then we draw a line through the middle, intersecting it. And then while we have this here, let's mark half inches in, half inch in from each end, and just do a pen line out to the corners. Okay, so that is our zipper box. And we are going to add this to the right side of one of our lining pieces. Now, if you have not cut or and marked your center line, go through and do that now. Got a nice little splice there where the center is. And actually, it does, it does help a lot just to have a crease there. And then what I'll do is place my center line onto that fold line. And following the directions, I'm making the tall size bag. So I want the top of my facing to be one inch down from the top. But if you're making the mini size, move it up to three quarter. So for the mini, we're gonna line up the top of the box at, well that's not three quarter, that is, at the three quarter line. And for the large, we're going to line up the top edge of the facing at the one inch line. So just one inch down from the top. Make sure it's straight. And what we'll do is we'll just put a couple pins in to hold this in place. And you can take this to the sewing machine and sew around this box on the outer line. So I'll just show you again where you stitch. You stitch the outer box only do not stitch these little triangles or the center line. Okay, we've got that all done. We've stitched around our box. So what we're gonna do is get our seam ripper and just get a small slit started right on that center line. And we'll use that to get our scissors in. And we're just gonna snip on the center line starting and stopping at the points of those two triangles. So we're not gonna snip into the triangles, but just start stop at the point. And then we're gonna cut straight out to those corners on the line, being very careful not to cut the stitches. So get as close as you possibly can, otherwise they will be puckers, but don't cut the stitching line. Now I'm trying to hold this way out in front of me so that I don't get my head in the shot. So, you know, likely I'll probably cut the stitches. Okay, so then let's take your iron and we're going to pr press this so that it's just starting to fold towards the inside. You could fold it into the inside without pressing, but this just sort of gets it a head start so that the seam is starting to be nice and flat there. And we'll just do the ends as well. And then let's flip it over. And being very careful not to steam your fingers, just roll out that seam so it's nice and flat. And we'll just start on the side and press along one side of the opening only. And that end out. There's no super fancy way of doing this that isn't a little cumbersome. It's always going to be a little bit tricky, but you'll get a little nice result if you just take your time and press it out. Can't tell you how many times I've steamed my fingers when doing this because it's almost like the steam button is just this automatic reaction automatic thing that I do without thinking did you know that there's a little spot in the top of your iron where you can actually get into a corner I think that's for colors on shirts so sometimes I'll do it like that and then maybe a little bit of water into the corners just to keep it flat and it's okay if you see a little bit of the front poking through to the back there that's one of the reasons why I chose facing the same color is so that when you do see a little edge of fabric, 
it matches but some people actually like to use a different color facing and then they have that edge showing so rather than having it rolled to the back they might have a little edge showing like that and it's almost like a fake piping but I like mine hidden on this one so you could see that there's a little bit of puckering here so just give yourself a little spritz of water kind of spread it out a bit and oops I'm squirting there instead of steaming and then again on this one a little bit of steam and that looks really good okay so now we have our zipper box opening and it's ready to go on the zipper pocket as soon as we make it okay so let's get started on our pocket assembly so get your nine inch wide pocket piece one of them put it right side up on your work table and put your zipper right side up over that it doesn't matter too much if the zipper pull is on the left or the right if you don't have a directional fabric because you're going to do both sides the same but if you have a directional fabric and you want this in the back of the pocket or at the top put the zipper pull on the left so what I'll do is just put a couple clips in you can use double sided tape if you have a very stretchy zipper or one that you're worried about puckering or, or stretching but a couple clips I find is all I really need for this tape and I'm just going to stitch this in place along the top edge using a one quarter inch seam allowance but actually just a little bit smaller than one quarter so if a one quarter inch seam allowance is six millimeters I'm going to use five millimeters just scant one quarter just so that we we'll put this pocket or this window on top you won't be able to see those stitches so I'm just going to stitch that and I'll be right back okay so I've stitched along there and now we can fold this zipper to the back and you can press along here with an iron and now let's do some top stitching right along this edge okay so there it is you can see my pretty blue thread and it's all anchored down and then I'm going to go ahead and attach the other side of the pocket which is again pocket right side up zipper right side up and the main thing here is to remember to get these lined up straight so that they are even and you can go ahead and clip this or tape this in place stitch there and fold it back and top stitch again and when you're done you will have one that looks just like so so it looks a bit wrong because the zipper right side up shows the back of the fabric but if you just Think about that for just a second. When you open up your pocket, you're gonna see the inside, which is the right side of the fabric. So put this on your work table and pull that zipper in just a bit. You know, I should have mentioned that my zippers were stitched closed. I did that before I started. It does have that in the instructions. So I'm sure you read, or you're gonna watch the video and then do it after while following the instructions so you don't miss little tidbits like that so that pull that zipper in there and then we're just going to place this right over the top and center it so let's make sure that we have this part centered this way and it's not off to one side so it's all lined up okay I do like to use my double-sided tape for this I have a three millimeter one which is one eighth of an inch. This Be Creative, this is the end of the roll, so it's not looking so good, but this Be Creative um, double side take, tape is quite a lot tackier than the Wash Away Wonder Tape. However, it will gum up your needle. So I put it on the very edge of the zipper here so that when I'm sewing in this area, I don't need to sew through the tape. If I put it any further in, we'd be stitching through it and my, t my needle would get all sticky and yuck. So, take off one side or two if you're feeling brave. Center that again. Stick that down. And then, peel off the other side. And I'll have to lean into here to see if it's straight because I can't quite tell. There, that looks pretty good. 
So now I'm going to do some top stitching around the outside of this box. I like to start at the end of the zipper and go back and forth a couple times. That'll anchor the stitches in place and also be um, strengthening that end when it gets jarred. So go back over that a couple times. That's where I start. Go all the way around and use a nice straight 1 16th to 1 8th of an inch. So uh, up to three millimeter seam allowance around the top. And when we come back, we will finish up this pocket piece. Okay, now I've stitched around that box. And I do want to mention that in this stage, it is helpful to use a bobbin thread color that matches the zipper tape because you will be able to see that in some spots on the back if it goes off. So, I mean, if it doesn't bother you having a different color inside on the tape, then it's okay. It still matches nice. Now, what we'll do is we'll close up this pocket. So flip it to the back and fold the top piece down so it matches up with the bottom and it's nice and straight. And you'll notice that the top piece is now shorter than the long piece, or than the bottom piece. So just go ahead and trim those so that they're both the same length. Okay. Now we are going to fold up the bottom edges a quarter to three eighths of an inch. So six millimeters to one centimeter. Just fold that up and press. So this is going to be our opening later for turning. And this is that pocket that I made super extra wide to accommodate turning the bag. And I think I'll just flip this over and press that back so that it matches. So we want to fold an edge here so that later when we sew this opening closed, we don't have raw edges and it's going to be a nice, the bottom of our pocket will be nice looking. Okay. So although we're going to leave the bottom of the pocket open, we do need to sew the sides. So what we'll do is we'll just fold this top in and you can clip or pin along here just sew along here and make make sure that this stop is reinforced well because it's going to be taking a little bit of pressure and on this side do the same thing sew that closed as well now my friend Natalie um, she often does leather bags and leather bags need quite a large turning gap so what she does is she actually only sews down two inches from the zipper and stops there so that you're only turning your bag through a tube that is this deep or two inches deep rather than a tube that is 60 inches or whatever this is so what she'll do is sew along here and then stop it and then later on at the end when we pull the pocket out I'll show you how she sews this section here so I've already done that stitching on this one so I stitched along here and then I flip it around and I stitch along here and I've got my opening right there and what I'll do is just trim off these zipper ends like so now it is quite close to the top of the bag and you could trim off this as well but if you do just keep in mind that you've had a locking stitch right there so you might want to lock that thread again if you want to trim that down. The zipper pocket is ready and what we're going to do next is put the lining together. All right so we've got our pocket piece done and all stitched up and we're going to start adding our gusset as shown. On page five in this whole section attach the gusset. So when you read through this it'll give you some helpful tips but I'll just show you the quick way of doing it. One thing we need to watch out for when you're working on the side with the zipper is that these little zipper, or sorry, the pocket um, corners could protrude into the seam. So we just wanna make sure that those are tucked out of the way when we're doing 
the attachment. We attach the gusset with the pocket down and the gusset piece on top. It's so much easier to sew bending something around than to sew from this direction blindly where you can't see what's going on on the other side. So we always sew um, the straight piece to the curved piece. So what we'll do first is we'll match up that center seam to the or the center marking to the center marking at the bottom of the gusset here. So we'll just, um, actually I'm gonna use pins for this because we are going to be making some marks. So I'll just put my ruler underneath because it's so much easier to pin with something plastic underneath. So we're only going to pin the straight section. So you can see the pocket is straight between here and here, and then it starts to curve up to the corner. So we're only, only going to pin the straight section from here to here. So I'll just put in three pins. And then to make it super simple, we're going to also just pin the straight section here. We're gonna leave the curves for later. They're a little bit more difficult, but they can be done really easily if you just sew the straight sections first. So what we'll do is we'll pin from here to where it starts getting curved again. So that would be right here. And you'll notice that this is too short. It's tight and it wants to pull in and that's what we expect and that's totally okay. We're gonna ease that in after. So we'll pin from here to here and I'll just put another one in the middle. Now, I need to mention the video that you just watched the last four minutes was actually, the volume was quite low. I forgot to turn my microphone on or plug it in or something. I don't know what I even did, but the sound is not great. So you'll just have to turn up your volume there and you can still hear me. And I also noticed yesterday that I had a nasty bruise on my arm here from um, well, it's not nasty. It's just funny looking from hauling firewood. So This is our section second section pinned and before we take this to the sewing machine and go ahead and sew these sections I want to make some markings and just show you how we can Make the seam allowance slightly deeper on the lining so that when it sits in the bag It sits a little bit tighter. So if the bag lining had the same seam allowance as the exterior it would sit in the bag kind of baggy so what we can do is take a slightly deeper seam allowance which will make the lining slightly smaller than the outer bag so it'll sit in there a little bit better we want to start at the 3 8 of an inch mark at the top because that's going to make it so that the top opening of the bag fits nicely with the top or the top opening of the lining still fits with the top opening of the exterior. So we start at 3 8 of an inch seam allowance, but by the time we get down to here, we want to have increased our seam allowance to a half an inch. So I'll just make a mark at a half inch at this last pin. And we can actually just, I'd like to do a, just a dashed line. Sometimes I just eyeball it as I sew, but when you're beginning, it's a little bit harder to do. So I just make a dashed line and that's just gonna be our guide for sewing. Over here, same thing. We start at 3 8 of an inch and increase to half inch. And then across the bottom, you don't really need to draw a line. You just need to use your half inch guide on your sewing machine. So what we're gonna do now is just take that to the machine. And this is what we will end up with. Where did you go? Here it is. So here you can see I have stitched these two straight sections and across the bottom. So now we've got these corners that don't lay flat. They're a little bit too short. And the reason for that is I find when you are beginning, it's so much easier to stretch a section of fabric to fit the curve than it is to try to ease in too much fullness because if this was a bit too long and it laid here quite nicely, you could have some puckers and that can be really stressing for, for us if we have puckers and gathers inside the bag, in the lining, it doesn't show up as much. But when you are making the exterior of the bag and you see gathers where there's been an excess of fabric, it can be kind of stressing. So what we do is we just do some, um, cut some slits. They're not really notches. Notches are when you do a little triangle, but uh, just a little slit 
only going in a quarter of an inch. Keep in mind that our seam allowance is half an inch. So as long as we go in an eighth to a quarter of an inch, we will not be clipping into our seam allowance. So clip about every half an inch along here. And then what we'll do is we'll just pull this section out to meet um, the edge of the fabric. Sometimes you have to do a little bit of adjusting here and here. Maybe you have more fabric here than here, but this worked pretty good. So just pull that out and use pins or clips. And you can use as many of you as you want. You can use a whole ton of these so that when you're sewing and you have it under the machine, you don't get any slippage. Now, I would just do one corner at a time. I'd take to this to the machine now and not have to worry about any clips on this side and sew my half inch seam allowance. So when you're sewing along and when you get to a section like this where you've got a bump, you, you get to that section and you just pull it in the back and lay that flat. Stitch a little bit more and you get to a section where there's a bit of a bump, you can pull that up and lay it flat and keep going around there. If you feel like you've stitch a smaller seam allowance, say a quarter of an inch, just have a look after you're done, go in and straighten it out. So easy to just to straighten out the seam after you've already stitched it rather than worry about being perfect the first time around. What I do like to do, and I don't have my awl here so I'll use my seam ripper, is when I'm coming up to a curve, as it's feeding into the presser foot, I'll take my clip off and then with my awl or my seam allowance, whatever's handy, I will just hold that in place and then I'll stitch up to here, take that clip off and hold that in place. You use that as a stiletto to help it so that this doesn't pull in. It's going to want to pull in on you a little bit. So if you use a uh, uh, awl or a stiletto or a seam ripper like this one, you can just um, hold that in place without getting your fingers in the way. You can go in a lot closer to the needle with that. All right, so stitch that up, and this one as well. We'll pretend both of those are both sewed or now, and then you'll do the same to attach the other side. You'll have the other side of the pocket right side up, flip it over, and remembering to have your gusset on the top, so you don't want to sew it on this way. It's the gusset that you're doing the clips on, it's not this. So sew the other side, and you can sew all the way around and then your lining is complete. One more big step that you need to do is to do some pressing. So, so that the bag sits nicely or so that the lining sits nicely in the bag, you wanna pre press those seams open. So first fold one side back and press it open and then you can flip the other side over and press it back like so. Do that all the way around the bag. Okay, so then we've got our lining done and we can toss it to the side and we're going to start working on step four, make the strapping. I'm just going to sew, show you one little piece and then go sew that and then I'll come back here and we will continue on the top of this section. So what we'll do is if you have cut your fabric from a 60 inch roll of fabric you don't need to join two strips to make a long strip. Now also there's no saying that you have to have a big long shoulder strap like this. If you don't want one that is 60 inches wide you could just use the 44 inch piece but if you're like me and you wear a winter coat you will want to join this because it go needs to go over my jacket and this fabric I've used here is actually a little bit hard to tell which is the right side and the wrong side because it looks the same on both sides but follow along on your instructions and make sure that you have the right side up for the bottom piece and the wrong side up for the top piece and crisscross them at a 90 degree angle here we just want to make sure there's enough sticking out on the seam allowance on the top and on the right so that um, when we do sew this and cut we have a seam allowance here so it doesn't have to be perfect, it can be here or here or here, but just enough so that we have at least a quarter of an inch. We're going to draw a line with my favorite thing, the Chaco pen. I love these guys. I don't know why I waited so long to use them. We've had them in the shop for ages. And we'll just put the ruler 
in the inside corner here and here and draw a line diagonally, which is a nice 45 degree line. Okay, and then we'll put a pin here so it doesn't slide, a pin here so it doesn't slide, and we'll stitch directly on that line, and then you can trim this off. Okay, so I've stitched along there at the 45 degree angle and then cut off my excess and now we're ready to press. And the reason why we do this um, specifically is because if you did a straight seam across here, you would actually get a lot of bulk in the strap when you went and folded it up. This way, the bulk is dispersed off at an angle and is barely noticeable and is super easy to sew over. So what we'll do is just Press that seam open and flat, and then you can trim off the extra bit that um, extends beyond the strap. I'll just give that one a bit more of a press right there. And now we're ready to put on the interfacing. If you're using wax canvas or cork, you don't need to interface it, and I haven't really instructed that in this particular video, but if you'd like to see that, you can start um, by watching my Aspen Cross Body Bags video, and I go into more detail onto how you would use vinyl and cork for straps. So for this interfacing, we're going to fuse it, leaving a quarter of an inch or half an inch gap at the end, and that'll give us a little bit to flip over. And this is for the shoulder bag strap. I will show you the other strapping pieces in the minute. So because our interfacing is only 20 inches long, we do need to butt up the interfacing end to end. And this is what I mean when I say we have to wait until the strap is made to put the interfacing on. So that's what we do. We go across the whole length of it and also stop at the other end a quarter of an inch to half inch before the end of the strap. And what I'll do now is I'll just show you how we're going to fold this up because you don't really need me to, sh to show you how to iron. I know we all love to iron. Okay, so at the top of page six, you're going to follow these instructions here on making the shoulder strap. So basically what you'll do is fold that quarter of an inch over on the end and then fold the whole entire strap in half once and then press along the length of it. I'm not going to show you the whole thing because it does take some time. And then after you're done pressing the whole thing down to the other end, take the edge closest to you and fold it towards the middle. Okay, and press along here. Don't use steam. That is for me to remember. I say it to to myself out loud because you know how I mentioned I always steam my fingers. So go down the whole length of it like that and then flip it around when you're done and do the same thing to the other side. So I think I might be going off camera here so I'll just move over. So this is a little bit awkward. <laughs> I'm going the opposite direction. Let me just turn that around. Okay, so we've now folded both sides into the middle, down the whole length of the strap, and then fold the whole strap in again. So you'll end up with a three quarter of an inch wide strap for the shoulder strap. And what you can do now is go ahead and um, tuck in these ends, if they're sticking out like that, and stitch around the circumference, across the ends and down each side. So I like to start with the open side and go down there and then across the end and back up the folded side. So stitch around the whole entire thing, okay? So that is our shoulder strap. We'll put that aside. Strapping is done the same in that we're going to fuse the interfacing onto the piece that's one and a half inches wide, but we can start at the end of this because we're not folding the edge over. So for this one, you will just Fold it in half lengthwise, press down the whole length of it. And this is just primarily for a marking, just so we know where the center is. So 
we will then press that to the center just like before and the outside to the middle and when you're done it will look like this so we're not going to do that extra fold we did on the strap where we fold the whole thing in half again we're not going to do that we're just going to leave this towards the middle like this this is called a two-fold strap now we can actually cut this into lengths i have you sub cut this into two pieces that are six inches one at 11 and four at four inches sub cutting you can do this on a double layer if you want it's quicker that way or you can do them one at a time so you can we've got two at six inches okay but we'll do the four at a four inches next if you want to use your guide on your cutting mat and not the ruler you can certainly do that too and two more at four inches this leaves us with one extra long piece that is 11 inches long and I've just given you one measurement depending on whether you're making the tall or the mini and we'll use that 11 inch one for both right now you don't need to do anything with those but the two six inch pieces you can go ahead and top stitch around them just like you did on the bag strap so these these ones are already done and then we can put these to the side and when we'll come back we will be making our bag flap so just to get us prepared for that if you want to grab your exterior front flap piece that has the foam and decoville attached and the foam is all trimmed away on the edges put that right side up on your work surface and then your lining piece wrong side up so the right sides together looks like I have two there you can follow these instructions here on step five to sew all the way around the bottom edges and leave this top edge open so I'm going to go ahead and do that and when we come back we're going to actually be attaching this front trim to the front of that flap okay so we've stitched along the sides and across the bottom I do like to use my walking foot for that so that um, since we're working on the foam edge there it moves along nicely and now I just like to trim a bit on the corners and the sides so that when we turn it right side out we don't have a lot of bulk in the corners and on the sides. so I use my pinking shears on the corners but if you don't have pinking shears you can just go ahead and trim this with your scissors just like I'm gonna do for the sides and bottom so I just trim these at 1 8 of an inch so just be really careful not to clip your stitches but you can trim that foam back and if you've used really thick material it might be beneficial actually to clip those basting stitches there with the um, seam ripper and trim this back to the seam but I mean I find with quilting cotton this works just fine for me and it looks pretty good so get all that trimmed off and then you can turn it right side out and press it which looks like this so when I press it I like to press it so that the back the lining side is a little bit rolled in towards the inside so in order to do that just roll that top layer out just a bit when you steam give it a really nice press now we're going to work on this section here okay so I'll have you stitch on that trim and depending on whether you're making the mini or the small you will have either just a little bit sticking out at the bottom extra or a lot because the mini front flap is actually smaller than this so we've got our center markings here from where we did that at the very beginning so there's the top center marking but we can't see the bottom center marking because it's been stitched in so you can just place it on your cutting mat or with a ruler and you can line it up and find the center and we'll just mark that with some chalk 
So it is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine inches wide. So we're going with four and a half inches for center. So we'll just put that right there. And maybe I'll just mark that so I can see it. And then where's our ruler? We'll take a ruler and we will join those. This will give us a guideline to put our trim on right here. I like to use some double-sided tape. You can use um, skinny tape or wide tape, but try to use tape that's not wide enough that it's going to be stitched on when you sew this down. So this one's five millimeter. When you put it on, it is see-through, so you should still be able to see the line after I pull the paper off. I avoid putting it in the top just here and the bottom because as we're stitching across here, we will, you know what? And I forgot to do my top stitching around here. So I'm just gonna go back and do my top stitching and come back and then we'll stick this on. Okay, so I've gone back and did my top stitching along the outside edge and you can base this close too if you want. I just have to say this fabric, this is the RJR Studio Digital Prints from the Bouquet Collection and it's just gorgeous. And it looks so nice with this Essex linen. That is from Robert Kaufman and this is, color is the Peacock Blue. It looks so pretty. So we're gonna put that on there. And I do have photo credits at the end or sorry, fabric credits at the end of the video. If you want to read again what those fabrics are, they're so pretty. I've used the lining. Um, the lining is also from the bouquet collection for RJR. Okay, so we're just gonna center this strip. This is the 11 inch strip on the center marking there. And I should say you don't need to use tape. It works well for fabrics and vinyl, but if you are just using fabric, you could just get away with using pins. So we'll just tape that along and center it. Now I didn't, my other one that I did, not quite so centered, but I'll show you what you do next. I kind of went off a little bit there. I don't know how I did that. Rushing, I guess. Top stitch along both sides and across the bottom. When you're at the bottom, just top stitch go across right there and and you'll end up with this little bit left over and I've left that there for a reason if you read in your instructions it's just in case this flap is a bit too thin for the lock so as you can see there's quite a wide channel on the press lock so that's the front of the press lock the tongue the this is the clasp and this is the catch so not the catch the press part <laughs> and it's gonna go on here, but I feel like if I trimmed that off, there would be not enough thick, thickness there. So I feel like with that folded to the back and in there, it makes a bit of a thicker section of fabric for the lock to go on. If you're using cork or vinyl, you could certainly trim that off right to the edge. But since I'm going to put this on, I think what I'll do is, in, in the instructions, I've just told you to glue the, this down, but I'm just actually gonna go and do a little row of top stitching right here, stitch that in place, and then I'm gonna trim it off. Be right back with that. Okay, so I've just tacked that a little bit along here just to anchor it down, and we'll try the lock from the front as well as the back, and it's gonna be placed right on there centered like that. So I'll just have a quick look and Maybe with my chalk, I can draw a little line of where I'm gonna trim it. So I'll cut that off just inside the chalk line. Okay, so that's gonna slide on there. And maybe trim a bit of this off so it's not so noticeable. Okay. Now, the main thing to attach these is to use glue. Yes, there are little screws, 
but those are mainly just to tack it in place while the glue is drying. So I use some E6000. This is a clear, permanent, quick drying glue, and we use this because it's non-flammable. Fabric tack is um, it's very similar and you could use Fabri-Tac for that, but we can't ship Fabri-Tac from our, our store to our customers because it is flammable and we can use this. So we sell this in smaller tubes because I find the big tubes actually just get squished. So, and the small tubes have little um, applicators as well. I just use a scrap piece of Decoville or cork or cardboard or something that's gonna let me have a little wand here that's a little bit stiffer and you actually don't need a lot of glue. If you use too much glue, you will get it squishing out. So I wanna put it on the side that has the screw holes so that when my screws go through the screw holes, they will get glue on them. So I put it, smear a little bit on the front and the back. And this isn't, it's more of a smear than a gob. You don't want it going into the mechanism either. There is a hole in there and I like to use post-it notes because then when I'm done I can just throw that in the garbage okay so what we'll do is slide this on make sure it's nice and straight any little strings or smears once they're dry will just peel off okay and I'm gonna flip this over and before I just go ahead and put my screws in we need to make sure that there are holes poked in the fabric because if you don't get a little hole started for your screw what you end up doing is actually just pushing or compressing the fabric and the screw doesn't poke through it and go into it okay so there's three screws although we only need two and I'm just gonna look at that again because I slid it over that's better and with a little bit of firmness, but if you have some resistance, back out and try again. Don't force it because you will strip the tiny little heads on these little screws. Okay, so that's anchored in and we'll just set that aside to dry. Okay, what's next? What's next is we are going to attach our strap anchors. Oh, I like that part, that's fun. Okay, so the first thing we need to do, following our instructions, is to measure over two and a half inches from the end. Where's my chalk? So two and a half inches, make sure this is super straight. And then another one at four inches. Super straight. Okay. And in the instructions, I have you then attach the rings onto the six inch pieces. But I mean, you could have done that already. You could have done that right after you made them. And then base the ends closed. And we're gonna place one of them right here across the edge or right across the center, lined up at the four inch mark. So have it just above the four inch mark. If it sticks down below, then you'll be able to see it later. So let's do it right above. Now you can pin this in place, you could tape it, you could actually take this to the sewing machine and baste across here, just above the line and across here, just above the line, like right there. So tape it across the middle, have a look. I can see that's not straight. Let's try that again. There, that looks good. And now we are gonna put two of the four inch strips on here as well. You can pin these down. You can tape them down like I'm gonna do. So just above the line, put a piece of double-sided tape there and there. And this is the sticky Be Creative tape. The Wash Away Wonder tape won't work as well for this because it's low tack. This stuff works darn good. So put this on the line, but then move it just slightly over so you don't see the pencil line. 
and same with this one. Ah, what a mess. Oh well, put that on. Now what we'll do is we'll have a look at that too to make sure it's straight and it looks good and it hasn't moved out of place. And I'll put in a couple pins just to anchor it. What we'll do then is take it to the machine and sew these in place going across the edge, down and across again. And that ends up looking like this. This is all stitched in place. And now you can trim off the extra at the the sides and this is complete now I did tell you that I would show you how to do rivets so I'm going to show you how easy it is to add rivets here you can do it anywhere you like but you could do one here if you want and here I kind of like them there so I've got my cutting board. This is an old bamboo board. Now on the website we do sell all the tools that you need to attach rivets. You'll need a punch for making a hole and an anvil and a setter. These have concave and convex ends and that will help keep the cap on the rivet rounded. You can buy a press to do this. However, for starting out, really the anvil and setter is all you really need to start. It's less expensive and but if you find yourself doing a lot of rivets you will want to move to a press. So I'm using the medium rivet. You choose a rivet according to the post length, not the cap size. So the post length should be equal to or just slightly longer or shorter than the thickness you're going through. So even if it was even with the fabric, this would work because it's, it compresses and compresses the fabric. You don't want it any longer than a millimeter or two than the thickness of the fabric because if you do that, the post will be too long and there'll be nowhere for it to go. So when it's compressed, it will just slide off to the side and your rivets will be crooked. So you click the back on you just feel a little snap. It's still loose though. This isn't finished. That doesn't mean that your rivets are set. It just means they're being held in place. And now we're ready to set them. So to set them, you, you put the anvil underneath one of the rivet caps with the curved shape. The flat side goes on the table. Now I'm not going to get a real good hit here with really good energy because I'm on a on the middle of a big table. It's better to do this over a table leg or on a concrete floor or sidewalk. Now we'll put the end with the curved side straight up over the top and it's really important this is straight and not crooked and you will hit it with quite a good force straight down. And when that happens what happens is the post goes through splits open inside the cap. Stick your fingernail under and just make sure that it's nice and tight and then you'll know it's done. Okay. That one I think I kind of slid off to the side so it looks like it's a little misshapen. So what I think you should do is, um, we'll just give this one another whack over here. So practice installing rivets on some scrap fabric, on some scrap strapping pieces and get the hang of it before you get started and I think you'll find that it's actually pretty easy. We can now add our gusset piece. So right sides together, we're going to do this exactly, exactly like you did the lining. However, use the 3 8 seam allowance throughout the whole thing. Don't start at 3 8 and increase to a half inch like we did for that one. There's no need to do that here. So what you'll do is sew across the base, attach and sew 
the side pieces on the straight. And then after that is done, we're going to snip this again so that it fits into the corners. This one is slightly more difficult, but you'll be using your walking foot for this. It really helps with the thicknesses. And I need some more clips. Clips. There we go. And I guess my clips are all at the sewing machine. All right, well, I'm going to go sew those up. And then I'll come back and I'm just going to show you one more time how to do these corners. It's a little bit trickier with the thicker material. Okay, so the gusset is now attached in the straight sections and I'm just going to clip around the corners here on the gusset side. You can clip right up to your basting stitches and actually just through them because if you clip right through them, it'll make it easier for the fabric to split there. Not too much further though because you'll be going in too far. You can always add more clips after if it's not if it's not um, coming up to the edge you can add more but this has been working just fine for me so I'll take the middle and I'll pull it over to the edge clip that and then I take the middle of this section if I can and pull it over to meet that edge and then the middle here pull that over and now I can just add some clips in between when you're sewing and you come up to the first clip you can push down with your finger so it doesn't slip out then take off the clip and hold it with the awl and then sew up to the next clip and then flatten that out hold it with your finger take the clip off hold it down with the awl and sew up to the next clip if you just release this as you sew what's going to happen is this will pull in okay so that's why we're first adding pressure with the finger and then holding it down and then sewing so I'm just going to go and sew those and we are then going to add the flap and then put it together okay now how did it go with that the front side wasn't that hard to put on but the second side you were having to push this down and sew around here and squish this as you go but like don't worry about that being squished we're going to press this after we're done so you really have to wrestle with it a bit to get through the sewing machine there so we'll turn this right side out have a look at your seams and make sure there's no sort of flat spots around the corners or seams that didn't get completely sewn so just run your finger around the edge and give them a nice check let's see that looks good have lots of little threads to trim here which I don't have scissors here but I'll do that after and this will all get pressed out later but for right now that looks really good gosh I love that fabric it's so nice okay so we'll get my flap so the flap is going to be closing on the bag like like so after and it's gonna look amazing so that means it needs to be attached on the back like that so what we'll do is Flip this to the front so you can line up your center markings here and clip this together and let's go over to this machine and just base this in place just using a quarter of an inch, inch seam allowance I've basted my flap onto the back of the bag and I should mention it's a good idea at this point to split the side seams and open them there so that when you sew across them they are open instead of closed and we've checked all of our seams they all look good fix any that you feel need to be fixed and then once again turn this bag wrong side out tuck the flap inside now we are going to insert the lining and 
This is the back of the bag. The back of the bag is the side with the bag flap. I like to have my zipper pocket in at the back of the bag when I open it. So I'm going to take the part of the lining that has the zipper pocket and put that next to the bag. So the lining and the exterior should be right sides together. So we have to actually turn our lining right side out so that when we stick it in here, the right side of the line of the lining is facing the right side of the exterior. And we will go around and clip this together. So starting with your side or in corner seams, clip or pin at each of these intersections so that they meet up. Then you'll take it to the sewing machine and stitch around the bag opening using the 3 8 of an inch seam allowance. You can match your center markings as well. And then I like to actually fill in the gaps with at least one. If you have a free arm of your sewing machine, this is going to be easiest for you. I actually don't, so I struggle a bit with sewing this. This is a little bit more difficult. It's not because it's a hard technique. It should be okay for beginners. It's because it's just a lot to wrestle and it's, it's sort of cumbersome to stitch around this opening. So if you have a free arm, go ahead and slide this over the free arm. And if you don't, there's a couple ways you can do it. Stitching in here. So you'd be holding this up to the sewing machine. You have to kind of fold this back, start here, and as you go, you need to rotate this around as you go. If you do have the free arm, you can slide it on and sew just this way, which can be really quite easy. Okay, that wasn't that fun. There was a couple spots where I had to go over it again um, just to straighten it out, and that's fine. Just take your time and go slow. Now we get the super fun, which is to turn the bag right side out. Oh my goodness, I didn't open my zipper pocket. Okay, make sure your zipper is open, <laughs> open before you do that. Um, it does say that in the instructions. Oh, luckily that one is easy to open. Yay, saved. Sometimes they're really difficult. So pull the lining through first and then scrunch up your bag and put it through the opening. And I think I will do that off camera. Okay, that's done. At one point I thought, geez, we're not gonna make it, but it worked. <laughs> um, if you had only stitched part way up the side of your pocket, now you need to finish doing that. So you would match these seams right here and sew the other side of the pocket here and here. But I stitched mine completely when I was making the bag. So that is not something I need to do. Tuck it all in and we're gonna go give it a really good press now everywhere. If you have a sleeve board iron, um, ironing board, now is a great time to use it or slide this into uh, the, over the corner of your ironing board. Press it all out and when you're doing it, looks like I've tucked everything into my pocket. When you're doing it, also press this seam in here flat, okay, and around the top edge, press it all, because what we're going to be doing now is we're going to sew around the top opening of the bag. And don't sew your hole closed in your pocket yet, because we still have to add our clasp for our lock. Have a look at your washer and find out which slots you're actually going to be using because those are the ones we need to mark on the bag and they're not always the same. It could be, you know, these two or these two. So depending on the washer, the slots could be off is what I'm trying to say. So we want to make sure you know what is the top part of this lock so you don't put it in upside down. Okay. And what we'll do is we'll put this on your table so that um, you can have a good look at it from the front and center it really nicely and when you're happy with the placement I'm just going to check this and I'm going to check this make sure it's centered and check that what I like to do is then just put in a pin at the base 
and centered where I want this lock. And that then we'll do a double check. And actually, it's a little bit too far to one side, so I'm just going to move it over a bit. And that is going to be where the bottom of this catch is. So then I'll go ahead now, let's see, and get my washer centered right above that. Check for straightness again, but I'm trying to get this video done for you. So let's just go for it. Okay. Now put your hand in through the pocket and make sure you don't cut your slots all the way through your lining and only cutting it through the exterior fabric. So I've got my hand back there. I'm going to be careful not to stab it and cut the slots just like so. And then normally we would be putting a little bit of glue on here, but this video is getting a bit long. So let's just pretend there's some glue on there. And then what you can do is I'm holding the prong still and you pr I'm just going to open this so you can see it, but probably can't. Place the washer over the prongs and then using the flat side of a strong screwdriver, bend the prongs down to the middle flat. Now make sure you have something soft underneath so you don't damage your lock. Okay, so let's tuck all this back in and give it a try. Hey, I don't have any glue on it, so if it doesn't look good, I can always fix it. And I'm happy with that. Now what you need to do is pull that pocket piece out and pin this closed and sew across there and then you can tuck it all in again. Well, I'm so glad I ironed it because now it needs to be pressed again. And now we're ready to add the strap. This is where I'm going to end the video. Add your strap, share your pictures, tag Mountain Saddlebag and Emmeline Patterns on Instagram and Facebook. And thank you so much for sewing with me. If you have any questions, of course, you can email me at orders at emmelinebags.com. Thank you.